Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. This show is brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation and the Compassionate Friends. Well, Heidi, we have a pretty uh, intense topic, but a wonderful topic because we've got some great people talking about peer support after a loss, right? Absolutely. We too have two experts here today, and we are going to talk about, yes, how do you, how, like you said, peer support after loss. And Compassionate Friends, who co-hosts this, is a big peer support group, mm -hmm. right? And peer support is so valuable, Mom. And, you know, I'm a psychologist, and you're a psychologist, and I'm always saying, you know what, a lot of my clients, I, I suggest that they go to peer support mm -hmm. groups. Because you can see a therapist if you want and have peer support. Mm -hmm. You don't have to decide, uh, do I want to do one or the other? Mm -hmm. Hopefully you've got a therapist that'll, that, that will be supportive of that. Right. And, and there's some research that's been done that, set, that shows the value of peer support groups mm -hmm. and how valuable it is in, in our own healing and grief process. Absolutely. I just actually wrote an article about peer support and some of the healing factors of peer support and just being able to emote and being able mm -hmm. to see people and being with people and seeing people that are a little further down the road than you are. Well, or and being, being with people that have, have been through the same thing you've been through. Mm -hmm. it, norm it normalizes a lot of what you're going through. And you realize what you're going through most of the time is not pathological. Mm -hmm. It's very normal. Mm -hmm. Um, so the two experts we've had today that have not only, not only are they experts, but they have had personal experience mm -hmm. with loss, and they are Eric Marcus, Eric Marcus, who is the author of the book Why Suicide. Mm -hmm. He is also a New York Times best-selling author. And it's an amazing book. I read it years ago, and he's updated mm -hmm. it. It's just got um, myths of suicide and things that we'll be talking about. It's a great book. Mm -hmm. It's very comprehensive. And he also rebuilt a peer support program for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. A wonderful organization. Yes. And then we have our friend, Franklin Cook, mm -hmm. who we've had on our show before, and we've done a webinar with him before. And we know him from uh, the Compassionate Friends. Yes. And he is the founder of Personal Grief Coaching. Mm -hmm. And he, they both do a lot of work for TAPS also, which is the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors of Military Loss. Bonnie Carroll's program. Yes, Fabulous. exactly. And you know I'm on the advisory board for TAPS. Mm -hmm. um, both Eric and Franklin's fathers died by suicide. Mm -hmm. Wow, so, so they really know where it's at. They do. And we also know Franklin from ADAC, Association of Death Educators. Yes. So he's really uh, put in a lot of energy in this area too. Yeah. Yeah. So welcome to the show, you two. Hi, Eric and Franklin. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you on the show. Now, you, have you guys known each other before the show today? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've talked plenty. Yeah. yeah. They run in the same circles, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> they were it's just like, at a TAPS conference well, so together. All, oh, they were. Yeah. And all men whose fathers killed themselves know each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a small world. Like, well, you know, all gay people yeah. know each other. <laughs> you know, when you, tra when you travel right. and, and someone meets you and they find out you're gay, they say, what? Well, and you live in New York. Right. Oh, do you know? <laughs> but it, so is, it is true, Eric. I think the grief and loss world can be very yeah. small, right? It's very right? small. Yeah. yeah there you are, know, and you do run in the same circles oftentimes. There are very few men who do the work we do. Yeah, and our circle of people who are directly involved in suicide bereavement, it actually is a relatively small circle. Mm -hmm. So if you play any kind of you know, active role, you kind of know everybody. Yeah. yeah. You kind of mm -hmm. know everybody. The the um, the practice um, has sort of a family feeling to it, which is good. Which is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of working with Franklin when I worked at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Ah. He does uh, trainings uh, mm. for AFSP. Oh, great! And that's where we first met uh, yep. about three years ago. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, let's start the show uh, talking about some of the myths, Eric, that I know you have in your oh, book. Oh, good. Uh, why suicide? Can you talk about some of the myths? Well, um, one of the myths, and actually the, the, the book, I wrote the book for people who've been through a suicide loss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I cover everything. And uh, around suicide, because people who experience that kind of loss usually don't know anything about it. Um, so I start from the very beginning with what is suicide? Um, and I tackle a lot of the myths. Uh, one of my, is it okay to talk about a favorite myth of, uh, around yeah. suicide? Um, my favorite myth is that if you talk about it, mm -hmm. that you'll cause people to kill themselves. Oh, yeah. That that, is then that's such a big one. A big one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear people all the time saying to me, Heidi, don't, stop asking clients and bringing it up with people. Right. Because you're going to plant the idea in their head. Right. Which is, as you know, as professionals, is yeah. not the case. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest myths, right. if you talk about it. And also, sometimes if somebody is, is, has got suicidal ideations and they're thinking about it, if you ask them and bring it up, it's a relief to them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. rather than, you know, distressing. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many people kill themselves every year? That's another thing. And who is it? Because, uh, you know, we, I live in Palo Alto and we've had a lot of 
teen deaths, relatively speaking, there you may be three or four in the past few years that have uh, gone on the railroad track. And I know you talk a little bit about the Golden Gate Bridge, and mm -hmm. so we that we have some high profile. But they're the teenagers aren't really the biggest group, are they? We are. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Middle-aged white men are the largest group in, in numbers, and so mm -hmm. about 40, a little over 40,000 people uh, kill themselves every year in the United States, and 80% uh, of those are men. Wow. And both your fathers were middle-aged men, yes, right? absolutely. Mm. Mine was 44. Okay. And my dad was 49 years old when yeah. he died. Uh -huh. Why, I mean, is there a profile like, okay, so it's men that are living alone, or men that are isolated, or not necessarily? Well, um, it's a pretty comp suicide is a pretty complicated behavior. Okay. So even though you could say that there are things like like uh, depressive disorder, uh, like uh, substance abuse, uh, being alone, uh, so you can look at some some uh, some contributing factors. But mm -hmm. it happens to everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. it happens mm -hmm. to well, everybody. that's good to know because yeah. I mean, some people feel like okay, that could never happen yeah. to my family yeah. or to me. And that's all. Right. I, 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 right? A friend whose son just took his life, and mm -hmm. she said, "And you look at the family's profile, and you look at this kid's life. Yeah. You could never imagine." Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it, it can happen to anybody, which yeah. which can also scare people because well, they think, absolutely. "Well, can we? Uh, aren't there signs?" And there are, there are signs, but especially around teenagers, mm -hmm. every teenager is moody, and mm -hmm. they, and teens yeah. can exhibit exhibit all kinds of of behavior that might indicate some sort of danger or, right. or a, a possibility of suicide. But then why is it that only one of the kids out of 100 who exhibits that behavior actually right. takes their lives? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, That's a good question. And, and while 40,000 people take their lives every year, which is relatively rare in a population the size of the United States, each of those deaths results in mm. scores of other people who are affected by that mm -hmm. loss. Well, I thought this might be a really good time to introduce a video by Neil Brinkman that I did with him at the Compassionate Friends National Conference because it, that really kind of gets us into peer support mm -hmm. because he's been talking about how he was supported by the Compassionate Friends and also about some stigma and some things that I think you guys will identify with. So let's watch that and then uh, we can have a discussion about it. Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, President of the Open to Hope Foundation and I am here at the Compassionate Friends National Conference with... Neil Brinkman. You, know, you were talking to me about your son Brian had died by suicide? That's correct. And uh, how many years has it been? It's been eight years going on nine years. Yeah, I thought it was pretty incredible when I came up to you and said you want to make a YouTube because you mentioned then that your son had died by suicide. And you know people there's a lot of shame and stigma around that isn't there? Yes, um, and there's a lot of guilt you know as a parent that uh, you feel like your love couldn't save your son from his depression, and um, there's a lot of a lot of stigma, a lot of stigma to it. Yeah, and after this many years, you're able to come right up and say that, and some people, you know, would not do that. How did you get there? Well, we were lucky enough to find um, compassionate friends right off the bat, and we met a lot of people that had the same circumstances. And there's something about being not alone. That there are people that can empathize with you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you get to tell your story, right? That's right. Telling your story that's so important to tell people about Brian. And, uh, and not how he died, but how he lived, that's right? That's correct. That's correct. So very, very touching talking to him and what I had talked to him earlier, what really tore up my heart about him was his ability to talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it, it's hard for people to hear that even, isn't it, that, yeah. that aren't in this world. Yeah, I think, uh, I think when someone dies by suicide, it's not that everybody feels the same way, but there is a lot of shame around the topic of suicide and so you do um, feel as if you've done something wrong, maybe, or that um, it could have been prevented and that you didn't, uh, didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is a lot of shame around it mm -hmm. for some people. Yeah. And a lot of people don't talk about it and don't want to talk about it. And I found, and you may have as well, Franklin, sometimes when it comes up in conversation, often accidentally, people will ask about your parents, mm -hmm. um, less so now that I'm older. Yeah. But um, I 
say when my dad died and he, he killed himself. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that opens up a conversation where someone you're talking with says, well, I've been through that too. Mm -hmm. But I also had lots of experiences where people yeah. would change the subject. Yeah, mm -hmm. that could and be then, a conversation stopper. In fact, I got rid of my periodontist because of that. <laughs> wow, really? And that's not long ago. That was just a, oh a couple goodness. of years ago. Yeah. Well, it was a new periodontist. Yeah. My guy had retired and um, this was a guy who took over his practice. Mm -hmm. and. He asked me a couple of questions between <laughs> between having his hands in my mouth, and and I I don't know how I came to I probably mentioned I worked for the American Foundation for, this, mm -hmm. for Suicide Prevention at the time, and he had a furrowed brow, and I said, well, my dad killed himself when I was 12, and he changed the subject. Wow. And I thought, I'm paying a lot of money to sit in this chair, and yeah. there are a lot of periodontists in this world, and I feel awful, All right? Uh, because he turned he just changed the subject and mm -hmm. uh, made me feel ashamed. Yeah. Now, yeah. what about peer support? Now, he talked about the compassionate friends, and you've been doing something, writing something for peer support, right? Well, I, when I worked with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, uh, we had a program called the Survivor Outreach Program where people could um, contact the organization and be matched with a volunteer, mm. uh, someone who, oh, had, oh, had, who nice. had been through a suicide and had training. And we tried our best to match someone match a person with the same with, with a person who had the same kind of loss so mm -hmm. a mom yeah, who like lost this. a kid was matched with a mom who lost a kid that's great um, and I know from my experience that in, in doing this work that people who've had suicide loss really benefit from talking with someone else who's been through a similar experience it's kind of like a peer mentor isn't it yeah yeah it really is I think I think um, for me, I really didn't get the right kind of help for suicide for the longest time. And my first really good experience was actually 20 years after my dad died. Wow. And it was from walking into a peer support group. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I was ever surrounded by people. And it was not a warm, fuzzy experience either. That mm -hmm. wasn't it. It was a very difficult experience. but. Uh, there were people there with fresh losses, and um, there were people there who were still struggling a year or more after after a daughter died. But talking among ourselves about that, that was my first experience with it, and mm -hmm. it really did help me immensely. Was and that's why I became devoted suicide? to it. Was, was it all that? suicide losses? Uh, the, this support group was all suicide that's losses. Mm -hmm. So now I work on, a, I'm on a board, Alliance of Hope. We have a we have a, an online discussion uh, that has ten thousand members on it. Three mm -hmm. or four or five new survivors uh, come every day. Is this for day. suicide strictly? It's for suicide strictly. And it's called what? Alliance of Hope. Mm -hmm. Allianceofhope.org. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so people can come. And yeah. Do you know, um, is there a point? Uh, I mean, compassionate friends. Um, it's kind of interesting because I've seen people come in from. Uh, Parents of murdered children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've seen them come in from mothers against drunk driving. Mm -hmm. I've seen them come in yeah. against suicide, and I've heard some people say later on that they wanted to get on with that they lived and not focus on how they died. Does that resonate with you at That's all? That's a wonderful goal. Um, I, for much of my life, I focused on my father's suicide, mm -hmm. not about, not how he lived because it was such a traumatic experience. Yeah. That was the focus for me. Mm -hmm. um, I've since been able to, through years of therapy, look at the mm -hmm. totality of his life. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know him that long. Mm -hmm. And the this, this signature event in my life around his life was his suicide. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I'm also thinking, you know, like you said earlier, you don't get as much support as someone that would have had a father die in a different way. Because people are kind of well, sometimes taken days, back. Well, in those and days, no one even, they, it was, his death was kept, his suicide was kept secret. Oh, I knew wow. it was something shameful. Wow. They said it was pneumonia. I knew because I'd listened to the keyhole in the kitchen. Of course. Kitchen door, kids know. They do. Um, mm -hmm. But because I wasn't, uh, because they didn't talk about it in, a, in an honest way, I didn't even tell anyone at school that he had died. Wow. wow. So wow. there were kids years after who would ask, oh, how's your dad? I haven't seen him in a long time. And I'd say, oh, he died five years ago. So you dealt with this on your, on your own as best as, you, as best you could as a kid? Completely alone. Wow, I didn't that's know anyone a lot. Who, that's I didn't a heavy burden. Any, yeah, I didn't meet anyone who had been through a suicide loss until I was well into, my, uh, well into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And my first time being in a room of suicide loss survivors was at um, a Survivor Day event, it's International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day, mm -hmm. um, five years ago. Really? Wow. So you had Actually, written your was, book, Why Suicide? Oh yeah, and I never went to a support group. Went. <laughs> yeah, I interviewed people who had been in support groups. Wow. It was actually eight years ago that I went to my first support group. Uh -huh. um, my sister-in-law took her life 
I, I was mm -hmm. so undone by it, I went back and read my book. That's amazing. And I thought, actually, I need more help than this book. And I went to a Survivor Day event, and I met yeah. all of these people who'd been through yeah. a similar loss, and I couldn't believe it. It was easy for me to write the book. It wasn't easy, but I could do it at a distance. Right. Um, actually being in it with other people who'd been through a suicide loss, it scared me. Mm -hmm. um, but then I felt I had to because I was so undone by the, by the second suicide. Yeah. yeah. And this was your, by your sister-in-law's? It was my, my partner's sister, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so when she died, you felt like you had to go, go Eight to years ago, yeah. yeah. So I went, I went and met other people. It was revelatory. So what about group? What would you say to our audience who's watching this now? What about group? What mm -hmm. about peer support? What do I need? I've just had a loss. Oh. I just had a suicide. What? And why does it help? Well, I think, uh, I think first of all, there are hundreds of support groups for people who have lost a loved one to suicide. But there are also support groups. The Compassionate Friends has 600 mm -hmm. chapters. Mm -hmm. um, hospices all over the country have support groups. There's widow support groups. So you might have to dig around a little to, to find a support group. But they're not all run the same, but basically, um, the model of peer support is that somebody is trained who actually has had a loss, has recovered from it, you know, um, feels um, strong again, if you will, and is really purposefully trying to reach out to people and provide a space for them to share. And that's really pretty much the whole deal in support groups mm -hmm. is a safe place is provided that is structured, it's not really that the person, you know, monitors or, or, or guides the conversation, but just makes a space for it to happen so that people can say what's in their heart and say what troubles them. And it is extraordinarily helpful for people who, um, you know, who like that sort of, mm -hmm. or, or who respond. Not everybody no. likes that sort of, right, sort right. of setting, but if you're a person who gets along in that setting, it would be extraordinarily helpful, no matter what the source of your loss mm -hmm. was. Yeah. So it's the wounded healer concept is mm -hmm. what it is. I just uh, read an article about Prince Harry where he said that he did not deal with his mother, Princess Diana's death. Mm -hmm. and that he was uh, sorry and he spoke to the BBC and said uh, mm -hmm. I wished I'd done it earlier I would advise mm -hmm. everyone it is not a weakness to talk about a loss absolutely mm -hmm. it's hard it's hard to do it when you're young especially if you yeah. lose a parent uh, when you're a child mm -hmm. um, kids process grief in a very different way so you might not be ready until you're mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm thinking the problem with that Eric and I agree with you yeah. is that here you guys were boys what you were 11 and 12 I was 24 when I was, I was 12. You were 24 when, my, when your dad, when my dad died, died. I and was 12. You? Okay. As much as a 24-year-old can claim to but, be a man. But I even was at 24, <laughs> even, at, even at 24, Franklin, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm 12, I'm 24, I don't want to do peer support, I don't want to do anything, I want to be on my own dealing with this. However, the, the, other, the mm -hmm. flip side of this is I'm blaming myself maybe, mm -hmm. or I'm thinking maybe I should have, I would have, oh, yeah. I could have done things. It's a big, heavy burden to carry yeah. alone. Terrible. And what, what right? a parent needs to do with a child who's 12 years old, yeah. a parent needs to make sure that child gets help. Okay. I wasn't in a position as a 12-year-old to say, I need to see a therapist. Exactly. Um, even as a 24-year-old, you could be encouraged by, if you have parents who are responsible people, mm -hmm. but you had just your mom at that point. Yeah. You had a big family. How big was your family? Well, I, you know, I, I, have, I have three brothers is, is, is all. So, but I'll tell you, I really did other than just the immediate funeral and all that, deal with it very very much alone. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, like when you talk about looking at a person's life and not how they died, for me, and I think this happens to a lot of people who, who uh, especially who die by suicide, but I think by any traumatic death, you're sort of captured by that. Mm -hmm. For me, I was so, um, so stunned by what happened mm -hmm. and felt initially so angry and so guilt, guilty that, um, that my father's death was what it was all about for a long, 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 long time. Is that time. now? No, no, well, no. And it's no, interesting because no. Eric says this, said the journey. same thing. Mm -hmm. Eric, yeah, I heard Eric say the same thing. No, it's not about that. I can remember thinking that my father was a coward, and mm -hmm. that's really what I thought wow. of my father. And that so and the much anger not, was angry that he was would anger, leave you guys. He, it they was would abandon you. It Absolutely. was all that. And, yeah, and I so know that my, my father... Uh, fought a valiant battle against a horrible disease and lost. He was mm -hmm. not. A, he was not a coward. Right. But that first, I yeah. uh, didn't. You know, let's end the show. Uh, let's end the show on that because I think there's so many people watching this show 
that love what you just said. Mm -hmm. My father fought a valiant yeah, fight through yeah. depression. I think yeah. that is yeah. so much yeah. the case with so Mine too. much yeah. suicide. Yeah. 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 And thank you guys for being on. And sure. It's been fabulous having you on. And thank you. And they get your book where? Um, BarnesandNoble.com. Okay, yeah. BarnesandNoble.com. Why suicide? Thanks well, thank much. you again for being on the yeah. show. Thank you. thank you, guys. And we want to thank you for watching the show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you to visit us at opentohope.com. And if you've lost hope, please lean on ours till you find your own. And God bless. When Todd died, I wasn't thinking of painting or, or anything about it. My, I, I, uh, my studio closed, and it was dark. Mm -hmm. And um, But it was probably within a couple of weeks after Todd was killed, um, our family came together and we were sitting in the living room and we were talking and we were saying, okay, what are we going to do to build a legacy for Todd? And yeah. from that, the scholarship that is given out of, from William and Mary was, mm -hmm. that, that idea was conceived. So on that day, as we were discussing things and the kids had all decided on different things that they were going to do, and I suddenly piped in and said, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, mom, you're going to paint. <laughs> and I. And I thought, no, the, the just ugly pictures came into my mind, mm -hmm. fire and mm -hmm. ugliness and sadness. And I thought, how can I do this? But, but then I began to listen to the words that were being said by his friends and other people. And those particular words brought paintings into my mind. Wow. Um, but that was basically, I painted seven days a week, wow. eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Now, what was the first? The first. The first were the, his shoes. Oh, oh I, I love this. It's baby shoes, and they're red. Yeah, they're gorgeous. <laughs> the baby shoes. Yeah, I think this is one of my favorites. And the, yeah, the baby shoes. Oh, mm. it's early. And his, yeah. his boots that came back from Afghanistan. And then in between. And then, one uh, yeah, we had Todd's dog, Tundra. And I left the door open so that Tundra could go in and out. and. Tundra came into the house and she grabbed one of these and she ran outside with it. I mean, obviously she smelled Todd. Mm -hmm. And that you was know. his uh, uh, Alaskan husky, yes, right? Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay. And I was so upset because it began to rain and mm -hmm. the mud was drizzling off of them. But it was this, it was this experience which caused me to then want to paint the three the three pairs of shoes. Wow. Ah, a so trilogy. Was, these were yes. the first. That yes, you did. a trilogy. Now, was it. this the first painting you did? These that? three I did together. Mm -hmm. How was it? Did you, did you just cry the whole way? Down? I cried. I cried through all twenty-one paintings. I painted to music. Glenn um, uh, uh, created a CD for me that had a lot of music on it, a lot of it from Sarah Groves, mm -hmm. and a lot of it was also country music that Todd loved, uh -huh. Zach Brown, and, and uh, I painted to that music, I listened to mm -hmm. it, and I cried. I, I cried I for a year, yeah. uh -huh. you know? Uh -huh. and, but the entire experience was so therapeutic to me, mm -hmm. and it was almost like going into a meditative state mm -hmm. through, throughout. Now, thing. one of the pictures I thought was really interesting was the one where they came to tell you that he died, and you, and the doorbell rang, and you didn't know, and you could see somebody through the window, and you thought about, you could see them in their uniforms, and you thought about your uncle, yeah, who had died in World War II. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's such an interesting painting because you've got your uncle up at the side, and then and then your son, and then the doorway. A very, yeah. it, it's a pretty amazing it, piece. It took me a long time to get up the courage to paint that. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually began to do sketches and whatnot at the same time of the morning. At, you know, it was about six o'clock in the morning. So I began to do sketches and look at the light and how it came in. And yeah, but I'm so glad I did it because it just helped me to be able to get through that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, of course, what art does. It, it does help you, just like music. So I was using both music yeah. and art to be do, able do to you know get what, through it. what uh, comes up for me is when you do a, do a picture or when you write a description of what happens, they say that it kind of takes it out of your mind mm -hmm. and you're able to put it down on paper and you know it's there so you don't have to keep replaying it to make exactly. sure you remember it the right way mm -hmm. or whatever. Exactly. It's kind of 
there and now you can have peace exactly yeah. around and that's an what event. It, that's exactly what happened. And um, I mean, the one painting that I did of the pomegranates. Oh yes, the pomegranate. Uh, yeah. And then later on, you found out that where he had stepped on an IUD and died up. while he was deployed, and you there was a pomegranate. Yes, farm he, right he next, door, farm next right? door. It was a pomegranate orchard. Wow. is where he died, and actually, I wasn't sure. I sort of had a feeling about this, and later on, his commanding officer said, "Yes, that's exactly what wow. happened." But I mean, I would, I would just be nauseous if I saw pomegranates. I couldn't be close wow. to them until I said, "Okay, I'm going to paint this painting," right. and and then it was fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you kind of yeah. purged. To, exactly. Got it out. I purged through the painting. That's amazing. Right. I, I, I waited until, with each painting, I waited until I could do something that, that was deserving of Todd. Mm -hmm. You know, they needed to be beautiful, beautiful paintings and the very best that I could do because they represented Todd. Right. And, um, and I, I think I did a good job. Yeah, <laughs> you did a fabulous job. You're such a wonderful artist. I love to picture of him with the baby in the swimming pool. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So touching. And that must have really been a tough one. Yeah, yeah, because Kylie is just this beautiful little girl. Of course, now she's first grade, second grade. She's just she's, yeah, first grade in, yeah, in Guam. In, in Guam, yeah. And we're very lucky because we have a good relationship with Emma mm -hmm. and with her new husband, Alex. Yeah. And I, I really appreciated as I read the book about the fact that you really um, ask her for everything. You know, could I, would you mind if I painted these, oh, yeah. these shoes? Oh, yeah. Would you mind if I did this? You were very respectful of, um, you didn't just barge ahead as an no, artist and no. say there was, I guess no. that's an important thing for it art. No, no bad karma, right? Right, mm -hmm. exactly. In fact, this other painting that I brought, oh, yeah, sure that. Um, these, these were three items that I had to ask Emma if I could borrow, you mm -hmm. know, in oh, order to wow. paint them. Because these were three items that came back from Afghanistan that Todd had worn in Afghanistan, wow. and I felt like I really needed to do that. I just want to show this because it's a, a picture of uh, Jeannie's son, one of your paintings. Is that yes. one of the big ones? That's one of the big ones, okay, right. A big yeah. paint. And where is yeah. that hanging? Is That's that hanging in my house. <laughs> All right, a <laughs> picture like of him. Thank yeah. you so much yeah. for doing that and for being on our show today. It's just been so fabulous having you on. Thank I feel so honored. Us. Thank I you. I thought, I just prayed that I'd be able to do you service on this show. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. And Todd. Thank and you so much. Todd is doing as much in his death as he did in his life to change the world. Not That's forgotten. right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank no. you so much again Thank for being you. on. Thank you. And thanks for watching this show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless. <laughs>